distinguished uh, panelists and also be uh, out of the room by 10.45. So we're starting a bit late. Uh, we'll try to keep things moving uh, rapidly. We had a conversation before and we agreed that we would uh, use this session in the following way. We'll first have a go through the panel and ask the general question of um, should business, does business, can business have a noble purpose? And then we will discuss in the second round of questions uh, what can or should a business do to achieve a, a, a noble purpose? So um, I will start just to put out perhaps the uh, extreme version that certainly for a long period of time dominated my profession. And I put this out as perhaps a, uh, an extreme stalking point for the rest of the panel. Um, corporations are not set up to function as moral entities. They are institutions with one mission, to increase shareholder value. If they try to do anything else, they are immoral. That would be a very extreme position or a very extreme statement of a rather, used to be a rather mainstream position. Now I assume my panel will not agree with that and I'm not saying I do either, but I think we should at least have that out there because there are serious thinkers, thinkers, excuse me, like Milton Friedman and many, many others who strongly believe that point of view. So having put that on the table, uh, we are going to start with another sort of uh, perspective that's an analytical or broad perspective, and that is going to be from Ian Davis, the Managing Director Worldwide of McKinsey and Company. Ian. Well, thank you, Laura. I think there's, uh, it's commonplace to know that business has had rather a bad uh, press in the last five years, but uh, I would just point out that's been true for the last 300 years. Businesses always been under uh, pressure economically for a, a variety of reasons, and I think we all know why there's been uh, more emphasis on it in the last five years. Um, I speak as a, a consultant and theoretician. I haven't run a corporation, but I have worked with many uh, people running uh, corporations. And I would just like to make uh, two or three points against the uh, thesis. I'm a, a business apologist. I'm a passionate believer that it is probably the single best mechanism for improving the state of the world. There are others, but I think it has a huge role uh, to play. And I think a lot of the debate uh, stems from the fact that the, there's, people have forgotten what I at least perceive to be the original purpose of business, and that is to provide products and services to society. Business preceded Adam Smith. Now, in capitalist societies, people use profits as one, perhaps the main measure, and that's why the debate. There are many societies which are not capitalist or haven't been, which still have businesses. And I just think keeping the focus on business provides products and services, I think it's a very simple, but to me very important point, which is often forgotten in the debate about the nobility and the role of business. Now, how well you do that purpose, I think, is the defining. If you do it irresponsibly, of course you're going to lose the nature of your contract with consumers, with government's employees. I think behaving responsibly is crucial. Uh, business is part of society, it is a societal institution, and it pr provides a role in societal welfare. So my basic thesis is that if it is done uh, responsibly, if business does its business responsibly, i.e. provides products and services responsibly, uh, if it does it well, by which I mean it meets the test of consumers, it meets the test of regulators, and possibly of shareholders. I say possibly of shareholders, clearly you have to think about shareholders of capitalist society, but when you have shareholders that maybe only hold your shares for three months now, which is common in the US and parts of Europe, certainly less than a year, I think we do need a different mechanism to think about shareholder value creation. So my thesis would be that the basic purpose of business that we be is noble, providing products and services. How well that mission is done will define how individual businesses are seen. I think profitability is one dimension, but only one. And I think there needs to be a much, much more robust bait, re, re, debate around this rather than the polarized version of profits are bad to profits are the only thing. I think that's unhelpful. Thank you, Ian. I, I would, I would uh, note perhaps two issues that might uh, come up based on, there are many issues that might come up based on what Ian said. I will just raise a, a couple of them that came to my mind. One is he, he mentioned the test of consumers and the test of regulators, that, that business must meet the test of consumers and the test of regulators. There are those who worry about 
business and its noble purpose, such as the author of the recent book, The Corporation, in the film that some of you may have seen, would say a real problem is that large global business is actually manipulating consumers. So to say that business meets the test of consumers is to miss the point that business is creating the needs, wants, that are their marketplace. So that's one thing. What is the test of consumer? How independent are consumers? How much should business manipulate? Use very sophisticated marketing and PR techniques to manipulate <coughs> consumers. A second issue that Ian mentions is the test of regulation. And here I think we have the issue that all around the world, particularly in my country, the US, big business is very much involved in the political process, in shaping regulations and in reducing regulations for their own objectives. That's perfectly understandable. But the test of regulation, regulations are not a given. They are, they are themselves the result of a political process in which business plays, particularly in the US, a very significant role. All right, next uh, turn, we're going to turn to uh, Professor Rakesh Karana of Harvard Business School. Uh, and he, I believe, is going to talk about the issue of the need for business to create not only shareholder value, but broader sense of legitimacy. And then finally, we're going to go to Lord Brown to talk about the practicalities of how you might do all of this. Rakesh. <laughs> Well, you know, I also I haven't run a corporation, um, but I'm not sure if that necessarily is a disqualification for talking about business, because if a physicist hasn't, isn't a good pool player, it doesn't mean he doesn't understand how the balls move and contact each other. Uh, so, you know, maybe uh, I wouldn't be so hard on yourself, uh, Ian. Um, with respect to, you know, business, I think, you know, we have to sort of um, think very carefully about what the purpose of corporations are in society. And Laura, you started us off that, you know, corporations um, you know, were set up purposely to return uh, investor money. That actually is kind of a misnomer. Uh, I work for the oldest corporation in the United States, uh, which is Harvard University. And corporations historically were set up as a means for maintaining community property so that it could go on without having reference to any single owner. Uh, in fact, many churches uh, were the original corporations. So I think it's important to put this all in historical context uh, a little bit. Now, with respect to what does business have a noble purpose? Well, I think we have to sort of distinguish between two elements of business. There are organizations that simply operate for economic outcomes. These are just sort of the organizations that if they disappeared tomorrow, we would say that this was part of the Darwinian selection process. But organizations like the ones that Lord Brown runs or that um, are the large central institutions of our society actually are infused with responsibilities that go way beyond the economic logic. That is, is that they're imbued with values that require them to operate not only consistent, consistently with respect to meeting their economic objectives, but also operating consistently with societal objectives. That is, that the responsibility of the business is to be legitimate. Legitimacy is a resource that organizations require. It is the benefit of doubt that society gives to individual actors. And late, you know, over the last few years, I think what's happened is that the dominant paradigm, at least in the United States, of the greed is good, that shareholder maximization is the only legitimate value for corporations, has really undermined, in many elements, the importance of legitimacy in business and how important it is as a resource. One only needs to look at the auditing firm of Arthur Anderson, which had been around for 85 years and disappeared in a matter of weeks when it lost its legitimacy, that is, its license to operate. Because ultimately, corporations don't control society. They are a franchise from society that society grants to an organization to undertake certain types of activities. And when those organizations are seen as violating the contract under which they're supposed to be operating, regulation steps in, the community steps in, and I think this is one of the aspects that we don't inculcate in our students at the business school, and it's one I think that's been forgotten by managers and executives, that part of their responsibility is, in fact, also increasing the legitimacy of their corporation and thereby the importance of a very important institution in society, which is business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one, one observation on that to put out to the audience. Um, I do sit on several boards myself, and uh, the American uh, Bar Association has made a general conclusion that uh, the law in the US, where you said in the last few years greed has come to play 
too strong a role. But the law allows directors to give some consideration to the interest of others, but compels them to find reasonable relationship to the long-term shareholders' interest when doing so. So when you sit as a director of a company, you understand, at least by law, that your first you are representing the shareholders. The law doesn't say anything else. That is what it says in the US. Uh, but this interpretation by, by the American Bar Association and others is that, well, that gives some room. And the room is to uh, make sure that whatever you do, you do it consistently with the long-term interest of the shareholders. I would argue, and then I think to, to play to Rakesh's point, it's certainly in the long-term interest of the shareholders that you maintain the legitimacy and reputation of the firm. <laughs> because if you don't, the long-term interest of the shareholders will essentially uh, be violated as, as the share value goes to zero as the company disappears. Now, we know uh, that Lord Brown is a CEO that is very well known around the world for uh, operating in such a way as to create terrific legitimacy and reputation for BP. So let's hear from him about his thoughts. Why is he doing this? <laughs> well, Laura, thank you very much. Uh, it is, I think, uh, almost inhuman to think that anyone should be in a, in a pastime, something that happens day to day that occupies them enormously, uh, simply to be told uh, that they're really of no value, uh, that there is no future, uh, and the worst is yet to come. This surely is not, I think, a great way to inspire innovation, uh, belief in the future, and something important for the world as a whole. It is rather, I think, to say to people, the best is yet to come. Uh, there is something powerful and important in innovation and powerful and important in the pursuit or pastime that is being undertaken. This, I think, is the problem that we're trying to uh, sort out here. Not, I think, one of legality, uh, not one so much of precise definition. But it is the fact that while I think the, I know, because we, we ask people this, we ask an awful lot of people this uh, over the world in surveys and so forth, while people accept the role of business really quite importantly, uh, I do think everybody wants uh, a better loaf of bread and they would recognize the importance of that. That's business generally. Uh, but, for big biz that's, but for big corporations, a subset of business, corporations being a subset of business, uh, people look at them and I think they generally say, uh, these people are very greedy, they're far too self-interested, uh, and their worth to society really ranks in a very low place uh, compared with a firefighter, a doctor, or a person in the military. This is a specific answer to a question. So the question really is what to do about it, which allows people, allows uh, uh, corporations to continue uh, to innovate, to add value, uh, to inspire and bring on people who can do that, uh, and also to obtain that appropriate level of trust that allows people to have a franchise without every single activity being checked before something happens. In other words, the benefit of the doubt is needed uh, for normal life. One cannot check every statement, everything, before any action is taken, for surely then uh, life really stops. Uh, I believe really the following, that uh, it is very important that business explains what it really does, which is first and foremost to think about the products and services that it makes and markets. Uh, in my own case, I think if uh, people inside the company that I, I run uh, don't believe that they're adding to uh, the capability of people to have light, heat and mobility, then I think they would lose the plot. They wouldn't actually understand what's going on. We're not very effective, I think, as, as organizations to keep making that point. Secondly, to get that done, uh, we have to think about, everybody has to think about how to create the point of best mutual advantage with everybody who the business touches. The mutual advantage 
it's obvious when you think about a customer, uh, you need to have something which is great and useful for her purpose. But how about putting a refinery next door to someone's house? Where is the mutuality? How do you strike that bargain of mutual uh, uh, interest to allow business to be conducted today, tomorrow, the next day? The same is true with arrangements with governments under whom we often operate simply as licensees. So it is about mutuality. That seems to be the second point that we should focus on. The third, then, is the outcome of doing all that so well uh, is indeed the creation of value, if only we could measure it in the long term. But conceptually, it is the creation of value. And finally, I make four points about this little formula. It is only just a little formula. Uh, is to make sure that all this goes so well for the long term, uh, we have to talk to people in a very transparent way. Uh, because trust, uh, the capability of mutuality, uh, in whatever dimension we talk about, is built on a conversation, which in itself is built on trust, which is about transparency. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Rakesh wanted to make a response. Well, you know, I think I, I, I like what you have to say, um, and I think it's an important component. But I think one of the things we always, you know, as a, as a sort of observer of business, is the disconnect between the rhetoric that many CEOs talk about with respect to the noble purpose of business, and then when you actually, at least in the United States, look at the actions of the majority of CEOs. And let's just take one issue, which is corporate executive pay. Now, in 1960, the average CEO made about two times the President of the United States. Today, it's 62 times. 1980, the average CEO made about 40 times what the average worker makes. Today, it's about 550 times. So, it's easy to talk about, I think, building trust, and it's easy to talk about, you know, how society should recognize the mutuality that exists. But when people observe the disconnect between the actions of so many executives and their willingness to sort of take princely sums at the expense of the employees, at the expense of developing research and development in new products and services, at the expense of the shareholders who often are retirees, I think it, you know, it, you know, it's easy to make the case among ourselves and I as try to inspire my students as well, you know. But I think when you look at the data, it's harder to reconcile these two components um, of, of business. And I was just wondering what your response, you know, how, how you think about that. <laughs> I, I, I think about this uh, uh, greatly. Uh, the, the real question, I think, is about purpose again. And I don't want to go into uh, a tremendous debate on pay qua pay. Uh, but I think uh, in thinking about the purpose of a uh, firm, the real purpose about uh, goods and services, mutuality, uh, and consequent uh, value, I think you have got to look at everybody in the company, and I mean everybody, and ask uh, and what precise contribution to that is made. What contribution to purpose is made, uh, what risk is undertaken to that contribution, and therefore analyze it and parse it out in a way which is not presumptive of past behavior, but is about the future and about the way in which things work. And therefore, I think you can map out very well uh, how indeed you should uh, think about uh, the pay uh, in contribution uh, to the contribution to the goals of a firm. And that, I believe, is the way to keep that uh, firmly in mind and also, therefore, to create a sense of mutuality internally. I believe you should uh, ask people about it, you should inquire about their views, uh, and you should be incredibly transparent, indeed, about what you're doing. Because, again, it seems to me that you should inspire trust uh, by explaining what you're doing. Now, it is, of course, a very easy charge to say to people, uh, the world is described out of touch with reality is but a perfect world. The problem, as I think everyone knows in business, is that the world is uh, what it is. Uh, reality is uh, the day-to-day. -day. Uh, and I think you have to therefore describe what you actually do. I, I do not support uh, talking in rhetorical terms. I rather like to talk in these areas 
uh, reporting after the fact what has actually been done. And I think that is probably the right role in this area uh, for chief executives. You know, Ian, I'd be interested in, in your view on this. This is a good segue to the, to the issue of what it is companies can do to signal, to get credibility on their proposition that they are behaving uh, responsibly and that they have a broader purpose. Um, the proposition that Rakesh has basically put out there, and, and uh, Lord Brown has given an answer, is one way to signal very powerfully would be executive compensation. It's a very powerful signal. Um, by the way, it's an interesting question about society, why societies again and again say firemen, policemen, and doctors, but then when you look at the relative pay, it's a struggle that involves oftentimes uh, uh, labor strife around the world to get increases in pay for firefighters and policemen, just as an example. So here are people answering surveys saying these are the most important people in our lives, and when you actually look at the way they are rewarded relative to other functions, you wouldn't say society in any way reflects that. Interesting. But Ian, what do you think uh, about that proposal or other things a business could do? They could, they could signal on executive compensation. What else could they do? What? Well, I think broadly, I think pay is just one of the conduits for people to express their distaste. I, I, I don't hear the same level of distaste about showbiz pay or sports people's pay, which is inflated far faster than business, for example. So I think there's been a general trend, but I think this is an easy mechanism to get at and ease about business. And I think if we are going to deal with that, or businesses to deal with that, particularly big business, because I don't think the same unease is leveled against little business, where often, in my observation, the behaviors are worse than in big business. But people are quite pro small entrepreneurial businesses, despite the sometimes obviously dodgy <laughs> behaviors that go on. So this is about big business and power and legitimacy. I think this is uh, correct. And I, I, I think John is on, personally on the right path. I think it's about transparency, about making very, very clear what contributions big business makes. And I think if it, for example, in accounts showing there's been a lot of talk about it, it's not a new idea, but what's the value added? How is that value added to distributed to society through taxes, through pay, huge employers, uh, through benefits for, uh, for pensions, through products and services of consumers? So greater transparency about the value. I think behaviors is important. How you actually behave and your con uh, conduct yourself, I think is very important. So I think transparency is uh, probably key and just getting the role of business it, Right, it's too dominated, I feel, by other dimensions of society who have tilted the argument so that business is always on the defensive. Sometimes it should be on the defensive, it deserves to be, but often it doesn't, and I think the balance has been tilted uh, too much towards other pressure groups. Just one example, and I'll shut out. You never hear about media social responsibility, or governmental social responsibility, or often NGO social responsibility, just to take the tag word of the moment. I think this whole thing has to be considered in a much more holistic sense, as John was saying, and business needs to put more transparently its case and value added. And then, of course, as part of society, behave responsibly. If that happens, I think the hot issues like pay will recede, particularly if the more egregious elements of that, I think the market's going to deal with that anyway, um, picking up on the point. Yeah, Rakesh. I, 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 I'm very sympathetic to the perspective of, you know, you know we don't criticize how much you know uh, athletes make, and we don't criticize how much Tom Cruise makes, uh, you know, twenty million dollars a movie. But I think the analogy falls apart when you bring it to business, because the purpose of an organization is to be able to do collectively what people cannot do alone. And so, when you sort of take the analogy that the CEO is Michael Jordan, or that the CEO is you know, Tom Cruise or uh, uh, you know, Julia Roberts, I think the analogy falls apart. In fact, it does fall apart because CEOs at one level like to talk to themselves as coaches, but they want to pay themselves as the star athletes. And I think the other aspect is, is that the, the, it falls apart also because when you actually look at CEO pay, it's actually decoupled from performance. And the fact is that when an athlete is negotiating for pay, you know, say from somebody um, in, 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 uh, in, in a negotiation, he or she is sitting across from someone who wants to pay them less. In the case of executives, they're sitting in a boardroom, often with other CEOs, who, in, given the nature of the small market, will actually benefit from a rising CEO market because every firm wants to pay their CEO, you know, at the 75 percentile, and nobody wants to say their CEO is a median CEO. So I think the analogy breaks apart, and I, and I think we, we 
fool ourselves when we think that the average individual doesn't see that. My experience is that people have pretty good BS detectors. And so we could talk about these things, that, but the average individual kind of has a sense. They may not be able to put the right terminology on it, but they have a sense that somehow there's two sets of rules. And so I think part of the CEO pay won't go away by the market either because the CEO labor market is not a market for just some of the conditions um, that I just described. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me suggest that this is a very, obviously a very uh, significant issue, uh, the whole issue of CEO compensation. And I, I think uh, we should, I want to, before we open it up to the floor though, I want to maybe bring up a couple of other uh, issues which are also, I think, very important to those people who worry about uh, the, no, the noble purpose of business or the social responsibility of business. Uh, one might be, exactly, uh, and, and I don't know if anybody on this panel wants to speak to it, but I'll raise it again. The issue of the m manipulation of the consumer. So that, uh, you know, there are very sophisticated techniques now to use, to differentiate, to reach, to create needs. And you could argue, for example, yesterday, sitting here with, on this, in the same room, Stephen Roach was talking about the fact that the US, in the U.S. right now, the consumption share of GDP is entirely out of line with where it's been for the last 30 years. Americans are buying, you know, five DVD players, six, exactly at what point, do, and, and lots of people in the advanced industrial countries worry about people not saving enough for their pensions. Well, maybe they're not saving enough because they're consuming a lot, and maybe they're consuming a lot because their value uh, is very tied up with what they buy. Um, and so, that, and that is an issue, I think, that confronts big business. Everywhere we go now, parks, uh, theaters, recreation facilities, is a constant advertisement for big business, absolutely. Now, they provide beautiful settings for us and, and, and museums we couldn't have and parks we couldn't have, but it's also a way of saying, buy my stuff. What do you think about that as an issue? Or, or do you not think this, I mean, I would direct it particularly to Ian, who's, who I, I like very much the idea that the way you measure, the, the purpose of a, a company is to create, to provide goods and services. But then, which ones? Yes, I, Ian, I'm looking at you because you started with that definition. Well, and I think that's an important uh, definition. Well, this is sort of, you know, going back to the Vance Packard 19 sort of 70s debate. I mean, I think if you're in a liberal uh, market, let's, with, this is a very Anglo-Western debate. If we had this debate in uh, parts of Asia, Russia, I think it would be uh, quite different. And it's worth in mind. They'd well, love, bring, bring the other They point would point love to have the choice. They would love to have uh, companies okay. trying to uh, sell okay. them things in a responsible way. And it's a very salutary for people, anti-big business, to go to companies where there are no big businesses and see how they feel about that. They're desperate to get big businesses in there for skill reasons, for employment reasons, for a whole host of reasons. I mean, my view is I think you just have to believe that in a, in a free market or a market, the liberal markets, that producers trying to sell their products and services, if it's properly controlled through the markets and regulators, is a legitimate thing to do. And that can be a debate if advertising is uncomfortable. That's a social issue. That can and should be debated, but I think it's legitimate. And then consumers have the freedom to decide. And I think that's the only way. I can't see an alternative to that in the liberal market. And you could say we should stop people buying four DVDs. It's wrong. I just don't see how that would work, uh, uh, point one. And secondly, when it comes to power, I think I understand the point about power, but the statistics don't bear it out. Uh, analysis suggests that the concentration of large companies in the world has not increased in the last 20 years. We know the survival rates of big corporations is declining. That's not conducive to the idea of concentrating power. So companies, there isn't any CEO or top management in this room that doesn't know he's under constant pressure to survive. So I think the combination of consumer markets, uh, society, capital markets, and the media is a tremendous control on the uh, ability of business, particularly big business, because they're the ones that are watched, to manipulate. I'm not saying there aren't abuses, of course there are, I know that, but I think it's the exception and not the norm. So I, I, just, I just can't make sense of this uh, 1970s wishy-washy thesis. 
But, but by the way, just, just so you know, I, I, I am being a little bit of a devil's advocate here. I don't have a lot of sympathy for the thesis either, but I think it's important to actually raise these because these are, you hear about executive compensation, you hear about the manipulation of wants. The manipulation of wants right now is very much tied, for example, to the debate going on throughout much of the world about obesity and, you know, the creation of wants for certain kinds of food and not for other kinds of food. So it is a very, it's come back in a slightly different guise. If I could just make a point on the CEO uh, compensation, I do think even the market is getting there. I think the CEOs were stars in the 90s. I don't think anybody feels particularly good about that, and they were paid like rock stars. I think we're seeing it change, the statistics brought it out, and I think as CEOs do become to see, if they become to see as team players, coaches, I think you will see uh, the comp through market mechanisms begin to come back to that, not least because of internal pressures. So again, I think we've got to be careful about overreacting to a 10-year 10 10 year blip in the history of comp and say, this is the trend. It was against the trend what happened to CEO uh, comp in the 1990s. One other general issue is, is the issue of the appropriate boundary, and there isn't a set boundary that doesn't change over time, between what the purpose of business is and what the purpose of government is. And I raise this because, again, uh, you have a situation in, uh, say, provisions of educational services where um, as governments become more and more pressed for resources, uh, more and more companies are in a variety of ways becoming involved in the provision of broad educational services for society. Is that uh, appropriate? Uh, is it the case that a better way of organizing society would be to have more resources go to the government and carry out its mission and have business focus more narrowly on its mission? There's a, I, I, I just raise this as how do, one, how do we decide when a function is most appropriate to government and when it is most appropriate to business? Uh, th there can be no hard, bright line, and forever test. Right. Seems to me it keeps developing. And again, I think it's a combination of public policy and transparency that makes this work to the mutual advantage of everybody. So uh, I think uh, reporting out exactly what you're doing. Let's mm -hmm. take the, the case of education, heavily supported by lots of corporations. It's probably supporting something that even if uh, government subvention increased the amounts enormously, uh, the support would still be there mm -hmm. for the specific and uh, focused activities that are taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, we we'll take another case, uh, which is the, what is the proper and legitimate boundary to do with political contributions of companies to governments. I take the stand that this should never happen, uh, and uh, we should not contribute uh, mm -hmm. to corporations. And indeed, public policy has moved uh, in that way requiring enormous amounts of, if you were to do such a thing, reporting. This strikes me as being a very, very good thing <coughs> indeed, and it should continue to develop uh, over the world. Uh, there are lots of these boundaries which keep shifting, and mm -hmm. indeed they should be tested and debated uh, and uh, moved appropriately. Uh, as society thinks about conflicts of interest that uh, arise uh, that thinks about uneven power uh, as uh, corporations change in shape over time. Mm -hmm. Rakesh? Well, I, I think you raise a very important point because I think part of what's happened in, over the last 15 years is this sort of University of Chicago zeitgeist that if there's some kind of problem, the market can solve it. You know, if we just put the right incentives there, the market will solve those problems. And we really need to, I think, step back and recognize that that when you think about the ordering devices of society, you know, how we create social order and the public good, there are really three devices that exist. One is regulations, which is really government, which works through fiat and authority. The second is through the market, which works through a price mechanism. And the third is through community, which works through shared values and norms. What's happened, I think, is that this sort of logic, particularly since the fall of the you know, Soviet Union and the um, uh, Berlin Wall, is that the market is the solution to every possible problem. We have a problem with global warming, let's create a market for credits. We have a problem with public school education, let's privatize education. We have a problem with running our jails, let's make people you know, for profit running our jails. And when you have a single solution, you know, it's like that old adage, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so we don't think anymore about the appropriate balances of other institutions. 
take the case, just a very simple case, the role of a profession like auditing in the United States. Auditing used to be considered a profession, one in which people were disinterested, one in which they would take into account the interests of the investors rather than their own self-interest. What happened is that you saw market incentives come in, where market incentives were that you got paid if you could make something look gap compliant. And once you sort of get the blurring of these logics, you actually lose the integrity of those institutions. And I think it's really important to recognize that government does have a legitimate role to play in society because of how its governance is structured through the participation of individuals. Markets do have an appropriate role in society because of their ability to allocate resources efficiently and effectively. Um, community has an effective role in society because of the ability to infuse things with shared norms and the self-regulation that goes to that. But if we just simply look at markets as the only solution to every possible problems, I think we'll fail to sort of take into account other possible alternatives that can be used to solve um, very important problems. And I think part of the problem is, is that corporations have blurred in the line in the political process to influence the regulatory mechanisms and in some ways also to weaken community mechanisms. If I can yes. add, I mean, uh, it is absolutely right that in the end, uh, you know, the, the market cannot uh, uh, operate without clear value-based decisions being made uh, on the nature of uh, where boundaries exist or where rules exist, which is public policy. So I'm absolutely with you there. I think one of the problems that business uh, actually has is government uh, uh, so absorbing the concept of markets as to create pseudo-markets uh, inside governmental institutions, uh, are very often uh, addressing and, and occasionally damaging professional people who probably should not be subject to these pseudo-markets if, uh, and these markets really are pseudo. So what then happens is that the concept of market is damaging the professional ethos mm -hmm. uh, inside so many of these institutions. I can think of academic institutions, uh, hospitals, uh, I mean, jails, all, all sorts of things. So it, this sort of backfires a bit and people say, hmm, well, if that's the way business works, we don't want anything to do with it. But actually, it's not the way business works. It is a deep misunderstanding, uh, and I'm absolutely with you, uh, of the role and function of different parts of society. Mm -hmm. Ian, do you want to contribute to this at all? No? OK, so let's now open the floor. We have about 15 minutes, and I'll just uh, start right here, right in front, and then try each side. <laughs> I'm speaking as an ex-CEO of an international company. And there were two issues that I think you didn't discuss, which I'd like to hear your opinions on. The first, the first has to do with the fact that when, when business deals with government, they deal with local individual countries. Mm -hmm. The business, if, if the, only, the only proper relationship would be for some international organization that superseded the, the nation state. We don't have that. So, if we're, if we're dealing, we, we, have the, we have the ability, and I think a useful one, if you get a second-rate country that's run by a bunch of idiots, uh, and, 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 uh, they, but they want money coming in, they're almost forced to deal with the fact that business can go someplace else, too. And, when, and uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you go to them and say, look, there's no point in coming into this place unless, unless you've got some decent... Uh, economic sort of arrangements here, and if you think that everything in Wu should be nationalized, uh, you know, go and talk to somebody else. And I, I'd like to hear what you think of that. The second thing is, and I was in a business, n not, like not the oil business, but one where we were putting investments in that didn't pay back for more than 20 years. Now, when, we, when you look at who we're dealing with in the governments, I mean, I, this is maybe a simplicity thing, but politicians seem to me to work to the next election. That depends on the society, but in the United States it's four years. Other places it's a bit longer. Labor leaders work to the next, to the next contract. The old idea in, 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 in advanced countries was that the civil service was the group that should really have the idea of where, where the country's going in the long run. Most Western countries, the civil service has been corrupted by the p politicians to deal with 
more short-term interest and you don't hear so much about the long-term one. My argument being that business, when it deals with these other people, is the only long-term player around. And I think that's very important from the standpoint of what's going to work. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right. We'd, I'd like to ask if there's someone from the panel who wants to address that. Um, well, well I, I think I, let me understand uh, and answer your, your, the first part of your statement and question. Uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, certainly in my experience in, in my type of industry, uh, that uh, you can uh, find people who've made decisions uh, which uh, are all different on how they will run their, uh, the business inside a country. Nationalized, mixed, uh, market-oriented, uh, sometimes simply in the hands of private interests in an opaque way. So a whole spectrum of things. You, you need to choose, it seems to me, as uh, someone going to do business, where then you should add value. Can you really do it? Uh, is it actually real or is it something which is fictional and you've persuaded yourself that it's, it's something when it isn't? And then consider how best to do your business. It does mean that in lots of places you don't do business. It's not to say, actually, that the country that's doing the business in a fully nationalized way is doing the wrong thing. Its objective function is simply different. It may regard, in our case, oil and gas, as security uh, of uh, activity, employment, simple direct control because the sophisticated levels of control don't work. It requires a very sophisticated society to make those work, that that's the best decision. It's neither right nor wrong. One can have an opinion about efficiency and effectiveness, but they may not be the things uh, that first cross a country's mind. So the answer is, I think, lots of mixed systems. You need to figure out where best to work. Let me just say on the issue of long-term versus short-term, I mean, one of, we, we do have a, a for any long-term investment, 20-year investment, wherever it's going to occur, you do have the issue that many of the interests that the company is serving are much shorter term than that. And that includes the shareholders we know are turning over uh, on a very rapid basis. It includes the politicians. In a 20-year period, it's going to include the workers and the members of the community. So in a sense, the CEO, the company, has to make this long-term decisions and convince all of these sh short-term actors that it's in the long-term interest of future shareholders or of future consumers. And that's part of the challenge, it would seem to me. Yeah, over here. Um, Jones, uh, I'm going to come over here. Can I, um, I have one question, um, or I welcome your comments, Mr. Crown. Um, one of the reasons why you, when you mentioned about the audit leading to problems in the United States is, of course, the United States has a tick box mentality when it comes to audit. Indeed, Enron would not have failed its audit. Uh, if you looked at the European method of value-based rather than regulatory-based and tick box-based, you wouldn't have the problem. So please don't look at the global issue and the American issue and think they're the same thing, because they're not. Secondly, I'd love for you to tell me what you think a chief executive of a corporation should get if what he's getting is actually too much. And uh, linked to that, is there a difference between payment for failure of a sports star and payment for failure of a chief executive when actually the market is telling them both it's acceptable? And to the three of you, could I ask, or four of you, Laura, could I ask you, how do you deal with businesses' problem of dealing with the greed of the consumer who constantly wants more for less and dealing with the need of the shareholder who is often a pension scheme who wants companies to make more profit so the stock rises, the value of their retirement nest egg goes up. Greed isn't just the prerogative of business, Mr. Karama. Well, um, I think you raised some very important points and um, you know I think greed isn't a prerogative of business greed is part of uh, human nature but the question is do you elevate it to a virtue um, and that's a, I think a, a deeper philosophical question which is what I think some pr people um, particularly in kind of the economics profession do as far as your question about audit I think you're absolutely right there's a big difference between principles 
principles-based accounting and rules-based. And, and the U.S. had a very transformed into a rules-based, where basically checking the box mentality became the norm. And as a result, people who were smart and wanted to use judgment didn't want to be robots. And they didn't, good people didn't go into the auditing profession, and the auditing profession became more computerized. And so I agree with you that there, there's a lot of issues there. Um, as far as um, the issue on the CEO pay, I think we have to sort of think about, um, you know, you're saying that the markets pay for it. Um, most economists would argue that markets are characterized by large numbers of buyers and sellers transacting relatively, um, you know, anonymously and then reaching some equilibrium point, and then you would basically have price takers and price givers. Um, the CEO labor market does not look like that. The CEO labor market is often uh, constituted by small numbers of buyers and sellers, firms that don't want people to know they didn't always get their first choice. So they end up focusing on one or two candidates and making sure that they'd be willing to take the job. And moreover, it's a market that's absolutely obsessed with legitimacy. So they hire search firms to make it look like they searched high and low, when in fact, the sort of small numbers of people actually turn out to recycle over and over again. So you have sort of a closed ecosystem. And it, it has the character of what um, uh, uh, was just called a pseudo market, that the rhetoric of the market is used to explain why you get this pay, but when you actually peel back the onion, you actually see it's people who are connected not only economically, but socially share the same uh, situation. Because I think if you had to at least look in the United States, one would have to ask the question that if the markets were really good at a selecting CEOs and that we were selecting the best individuals, you would have to conclude that in the United States, the best individual CEOs have to be men, white, and coming from upper middle class families. I don't believe that leadership is a monopoly of either a gender or a genetic group. Um, and as a result of that, you have to then think carefully, are we really choosing people based on an open market position? I love markets. I am a gen you know, private in the capitalist army. But I think markets have to be <laughs> real and they have to work effectively, otherwise people become skeptical. Otherwise it looks like a scam to them. It looks like just another way of taking money from one person to the other. Your final point, I think, is absolutely dead on. Um, in 1960, less than 10%, at least in the US, of the population participated in the stock market. Today, in excess of 50% of people participate in the stock market in some form. And this is due to a variety of changes that happened in the United States, the shift from defined benefit pension plans to defined contribution plans like 401ks. And so the individual member in society has a much more complicated relationship with corporations than they had in the past. So just to take your example, in Walmart, when I go to Walmart, I want the lowest